from the family workforce meeting here today. Uh, and it will be presented by Cindy Hedge, who is lead trainer at Wildflower Alliance and also involved in the Hearing Voices USA Network. Just some housekeeping information. Uh, your microphones were muted at entry. If you could stay on mute, unless you have um, a question during the Q&A portion of the webinar, which will be toward the end. If you have a burning question that you don't want to forget, either write it down or you can put it in the chat and we will do our best to make sure we bring that up later. Uh, closed captioning is available for the event. Just click on the closed captioning or the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen to select the transcription option. You can always let us know in the chat if you need help with any of these things and we'll do our best to guide you through it. This session, as you saw, is being recorded and it will be available on the MHTTC website uh, within 24 hours, I'd say 24 to 48, <laughs> of the close of this presentation. Uh, information about certificates of attendance will be sent in a follow-up email. If you have questions during the webinar, again, please use the chat, um, or you could use the raise hand feature during the Q&A particularly, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and you can unmute your own microphone alternately during that portion as well. If you have questions after the session for MHTTC, you can email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. There are regional MHTTC um, entities are across the USA and, and in some of the territories as well. It's inclusive of that. Uh, there are also as many as you, of you know, addiction TTCs. And then the third leg is uh, the trauma uh, and prevention, prevention TTCs. So there's those three legs. Um, and of course, many times they overlap and we come together on a lot of our topics. Just our regular disclaimer that the this publication was prepared by the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center under a cooperative agreement from SAMHSA. All material appearing in the publication, except that taken directly from copyrighted sources, is in the public domain and may be reproduced or copied without permission from SAMHSA or the authors. Citation of the source is appreciated. Do not reproduce or distribute this presentation for a fee without specific written authorization from New England MHTTC. And at the time of this release, Dr. Miriam Delpin Rittman is serving as Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at SAMHSA. The opinions expressed herein are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. No official support or endorsement of DHHS or SAMHSA for the opinions described in this presentation is intended or should be inferred. And we have the grant number there from DHHS and SAMHSA. We want to confirm that MHTTC Network is affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented, and we use that language in all activities. We strive for that. And that means that language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, um, and that individ encouraging individuals to participate in their own journeys, person-first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear, and understandable, and consistent with our actions, policies, and products. And we like to do a land acknowledgement as a committed ally, New England MHTTC recognizes that the New England area is home to the ancestral land of many native tribes. Uh, consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we acknowledge that all the places our distributed staff live and work, as well as where we provide services and hold events, are Indigenous lands. And I am going to stop sharing. And just, I'd like to just say a couple brief words to introduce our speaker today. Uh, I know a number of people 
family members and friends who are or have been voice hearers or who hold or have held non-typical or non-consensus um, beliefs. Their experiences have varied widely from almost no impact um, to decades long institutionalization. Uh, I was personally impacted the most by the trauma of being separated from my mother when she was labeled with various disorders, including psychotic disorders um, and hospitalized for lengthy periods of time. So unfortunately it happened early and often because the traditional response, um, hospitals, medications, ECT did not work well for her outside of a period um, sometimes of acute distress. And trying to make them work over and over and over and over again was both harmful and traumatic. We need choices and families via the family workforce or through educating yourselves um, or through staff that have contact with families, we need to be aware that there are many different theories of emotional distress. And so why not different choices of response? One of these responses, the Hearing Voices Network or HVN approach, uh, many of you may be very familiar with them, has done some amazing work um, with individuals who are voice hearers, uh, but also they've done some work with families that you may or may not be aware of, and we're glad you're here today to hear more. And our distinguished presenter today, Cindy Hadge, is one of the pioneers in this space. Additionally, not only is Cindy a voice hearer, but also a family member with experiences supporting other family members, um, giving her unique and powerful experiences with which to lead in this space. So I am honored and thrilled to be able to introduce today's presenter from Wildflower Alliance, located in Western Massachusetts, Cindy Hedge. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you so much. What a wonderful uh, introduction. And I, I kind of feel like I'm at home. We're going to talk about people and their strengths and how they move th through things and how different people need different things. So let's have possibilities. Um, I can tell you right off the bat, I don't have all the answers. I have a lot of great questions, but a lot of the answers are really within a family or within a family dynamic or an individual. I can't tell you what's always right for somebody else, but I can help people figure that out, create a spa space where they can talk it through and, and perhaps learn of other possibilities. And I'm just getting my slides up here. Um, yeah, I, I, and I'll be uh, very honest and transparent. Um, the word psychosis has been used against me. And so it, I know it has a definition and there's lots of stuff in that definition that resonates with me, but the way that word has been used, sometimes it's been used to really marginalize people. And so this is my uh, compromise to say, you know, experiences that have been labeled as psychosis and uh and a little bit more about me is uh, i'm somebody who started hearing voices as a kid uh a lot of times it was really helpful and then it became really hard eventually you know i ended up in the mental health system where i kind of got stuck i tried to be a good patient you know let's try a different cocktail Let's try another combination. And uh, eventually I ended up on Thorazine. And um, my life didn't seem like it was worth living. That's how I felt. If this was as good as it gets, not so interested. And what I did was uh, I remembered peer support in the form of 12 step had helped me in my life. And I thought, maybe is there something like that? And I put in uh, mental health peer support. And I found out I lived within walking distance of one of the Wildflower Alliance's uh, centers. And uh, it was really amazing because I got to meet people who were living their lives. And I didn't have to say I had a diagnosis to be able to go. We we're just all people hanging out. Uh, you know, whether people had experienced trauma, hard times, loss, grief, whatever, people could define their experiences in their own words. And uh, I have the pleasure now 
of, you know, over the years, going from that person walking in on Thorazine who said nothing. And I said nothing for like months. I used to joke I uh, isolated with people. That was, you know, that was a step for me. Can I tolerate being around people at all? And um, now I'm a lead trainer and we do a lot of amazing stuff uh, all over the world. And I do want to say that um, there were five community health organizations that got named in the World Health Organization's uh, book on mental health approaches, and we are one of them. And, it, you know, it talked about uh, peer-centered, right, human rights-centered approaches, empowering approaches to move through difficult times or distressing experiences. But anyways, I get to this place, the Wildflower Alliance, and I find out there's a hearing voices group. And at the time, there was maybe a total of five of them in the entire country. And so I want to clarify that Hearing Voices Network, it's not just about hearing voices. You know, it, that's kind of a catch-all phrase, but, you know, if you think you can get a personal benefit of going to the group and you want to talk about your dreams, your inner critic, uh, maybe unusual beliefs, I... I chuckle nowadays about unusual beliefs because I turn on the news and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of unusual beliefs out there. Like, oh my goodness, how do I reconcile those uh, beliefs? Anyways, um, hearing voices uh, groups encourage me to become the expert on my experience. And we're like, okay, you, you have medication in your toolbox. What else can you put in there? And they said, oh, by the way, there's a big difference between nothing and Thorzy. You might think about some stuff in between. And um, and anyway, so, you know, at first, you know, I just wanted them to fix me. But then I realized uh, I had to do some work. And what were those other tools? And uh, when I finally did speak at the group, I said, you know, I probably listed diagnoses and said how screwed up I was. And right off the bat, they said, uh, you're still on the planet. You must have some strategies. You must have some skill. And so I could go there and feel like a human being versus a mental patient and to have people help me expand that view of possibility for myself. Uh, here are some of the values of HVN because I just want you to know where I'm coming from in this, uh, that hearing voices is, is not necessarily a sign of illness. Uh, hearing voices is a normal, though deeply personal variation of human experience. And for instance, it's very common to hear from a lost loved one. People who've never had a diagnosis, this is a common experience to hear or see or vividly dream of that lost loved one. And it's usually a very positive experience. Sometimes not, but usually. Uh, so that's a common human experience that people have. They just, it's just uncommon for people to have a place to talk about it. Uh, one in 10 people hear voices at some point in life. Uh, this is a research coming out of the hearing voices approach, but I'll tell you there are cultures where it's expected. You are supposed to hear from your ancestors. There's something wrong with you if you don't. So I just want to say that one in 10 is a very westernized st statistic. Um, in this research that Marius Rom, he's a psychiatrist who along with Patsy Haga kind of started looking at voices in a different way. Um, in the research they did, he he was surprised. He was it was not his belief. He thought if you heard voices, you had a mental illness. But they do this research and he finds out that a third of voice hearers never seek psychiatric services. Their lives are not disrupted, and they're having meaningful lives. And so that was an eye opener for him. Um, and as he did more research. Uh, he came up with this belief that hearing voices make sense in relationship to our personal life experiences. No matter how weird, outrageous, I don't get it, experience somebody's having, if I can be curious, somehow the emotion in there, the dilemma in there, the story in there 
relates to stuff in their life. Which kind of makes sense to me that, you know, we're all trying to figure things out. And, uh, and what do we use to figure that out? What we know. That people who hear voices can cope with their experiences by owning and making meaning of their voices. And uh, it's hard to uh, make meaning and figure out why this is happening if you can't actually talk about the voices or if you can't actually talk to the voices or if you can't engage with them or have somebody engage with them with you. And so, you know, I'm kind of the evidence that people can change their relationship to their experience. And so in 2019, uh, HVN USA was getting all these letters from families and it was kind of overwhelming. And uh, people encouraged me to, to try to step in there because I have a family, I have five kids and one of them had a, a very unusual belief. He wanted to be Batman and he wanted me to buy the bulletproof vest and you know, I don't have the money that Batman has so it was really hard. But his intent was, you know, he had been hurt. And, um, an adult was inappropriate with him, and he wanted to stop everybody else in the world from getting hurt. And so, you know, this idea of how do you support and navigate an experience with somebody having a big unusual belief. So he started uh, HVN Friends and Family Groups, a place for people to come to talk about not just their loved one, but how they're handling it. You know, what what are their fears? What are their hopes? What are their um, strategies? And that so many times people end up in, in quote unquote crisis or at the hospital, you know, it's more of a relation issue. It's not just the individual, but it's the individual in relationship to other people. And if the other people around them have more support, more strategies, you know, maybe we can navigate a situation differently. And here are the values of those groups to uh, respect. I think this is a hard, this can be the hardest one initially. Respect their loved one's experience. People would say to me, Oh, they're having a delusion. Oh, they're having paranoia. And I would say, you know, they're, they're having a fear. Let's figure out where that fear is coming from. Or when you're afraid, you know, what's helpful to you? It was almost like if there was a label on it, it got dismissed instead of explored. Uh, you know, examine how parents feel, you know. And we'll talk more as we go along and for the parents to take ownership of their fears. In these groups, you know, people get to share what's been helpful, um, but it's not about telling anybody what to do and knowing that each family has its own limitations or its own values and, and to really just share more about, you know, well, this is what worked for us. And somebody else can say, well, this worked for us. And somebody else said, no, how have you dealt with this? And so people are, it's more like brainstorming possibilities versus providing directives. This last one about creating a safer place for family members to talk about their experiences without judgment, ridicule, ridicule or unsolicited advice is really important. When my son was struggling, everybody had an opinion. People who hadn't even met him had an opinion on what I should do. And I had to wrestle with, you know, my own thoughts of like, oh, is this all my fault? And why can't I fix it? And so there's a lot going on there that's worth talking about. I want to share some uh, common challenges that, that, that I've seen with families, uh, that the focus becomes all about, you know, I'll say with my family of origin, you know, the focus is all about Cindy and how do we get Cindy to do what Cindy needs to do? And it wasn't about, you know, the fears that other people had around me or how do we negotiate relationships? You know, whatever I was going through was in a context. Uh, and um, 
And the more you treat, the more I got treated like, oh, this meeting is about what's wrong with me, the less I was invested in participating. If parents feel judged, uh, you know, I know for me being a parent, if your kid doesn't come out perfect, you know, I think it's normal to say, what did I do wrong? Or, uh, or feeling responsible for everything that this little or big human being who I can't control does. Um, I haven't found shame and guilt helpful. I see a lot of it around and I find it really get in the way. Uh, so the loved one feels shamed and guilt and judged and frequently judged. Uh, and so does the person going through the experience. When I was going through it, you know, I, I definitely felt like, oh, I'm in trouble or I'm bad or, you know, when somebody would say, you know, no, that's not really happening, happening, I would feel like, oh, are you calling me a liar or uh, it was really weird. <laughs> this whole feeling responsible to versus for. Now, you know, it took me a while to realize I don't have the power to control anybody. My best hope is to control what comes out of my mouth and how I react. But as parents, sometimes we feel like we have a responsibility to do that. My responsibility is to show up in a good way. My responsibility is to put my best foot forward. That makes sense to people. And I know sometimes people in clinical roles have the same issue. People are like, you're responsible to make sure so-and-so doesn't X, Y, or Z. But frequently, we don't have that power. I have my responsibility to do the best job I can do. I'm hoping people can see the difference there. Um, power struggles in families. Uh, between family members and between providers. I know um, when my son was interfacing with the mental health system, I felt like I lost power. I had to trust my loved one to total strangers who frequently didn't even want to talk to me. You know, they had their plan, their vision. They're saying my kid on one of the worst days of his life and they think they have an accurate picture of him. It was really tough. Um, and, you know, uh, struggles between family members and providers. I can remember arguing with a, a prescriber. I said, you can't prescribe my son Adderall. He's drinking. Oh, no, we need to prescribe that for him to help him in the school. And uh, I'm like, no, it could kill him. And we had this huge argument and... Uh, Eventually, things happened, and the prescriber actually apologized to me. But it was really tough, a really tough experience. Like, they they learned something in the moment, and I learned, wow, help doesn't always feel helpful. Uh, Fear-based responses. Another issue is that the whole family is suffering from grief and loss. No. Uh, my hopes or dreams are temporarily not happening for my kid. My kid is saying, why doesn't my life look like my peers? You know, is there a place to talk about that? Is there a place to have those feelings? Is anybody talking about those feelings? Uh, this other is one concern. The concern one, I see a lot. Uh, parents might say, somebody walks in, how are you doing? How did it go? Was it okay? And the person walking in is like, oh, they're so aggressive. Oh, they're harassing me. And the parent's like, love and concern. And the, the family member's like, aggression, haranguing me. They're just trying to figure out whether I need to be in the hospital again. Like, how do we do that? And uh, I negotiated that with a particular family. And my dad said, I just miss you. You don't talk to me. I just want to know you're okay. And the uh, adult son said, I just don't want to be talked to like I'm a mental patient. Can we just be people? Can we just hang out? And so what they uh, negotiated was uh, watching three ball games a week together. You know, that was their way of being together and building a trusting relationship. Um, 
secrets. And sometimes these secrets are like just blown out of proportion. Or sometimes these secrets are not actually accurate. It's like, oh, you had a piece of the information, not all the information. It's also part of a childhood development that kids and voices sometimes have this magical thinking that they're responsible for all these things that they have no power over. If I was good enough, my parents wouldn't have gotten divorced. If I was good enough, my parents wouldn't argue. You know, so it's interesting to try to unpack those uh, competing needs and narratives. Uh, I was just in a family meeting where the two people have two different narratives, but the parent, not only that, the, the parent is of this perspective is mine is right and yours is wrong. And I'm like, no. Your adult child is talking about how this impacted him. Be curious, be listen, and listen. You don't have to defend yourself. And, you know, that's one of those multiple truths. Uh, sometimes I say it's like a family can be on a bus, but they're sitting in different seats. So the views out the window may look really different. Um, and exhaustion. Exhaustion is a huge one with families. Uh, sometimes uh, somebody ends up at the ER, not because they're in huge distress, but because the family's worn out. They're just worn out and they need more support. Um, yeah, this, this exha exhaustion thing is, if I could set a limit in a relationship, I could save it. Sometimes I see people, family give more than they have, and then they're like, I'm done. And wouldn't it have been great if you could have set a limit earlier? I'm saying, this is what I can deal with. I can't deal with beyond that. You know, this is the limit. And so it's interesting. Everybody gets to figure that out. But uh, a little more about HVN. Research that Marius did, you know, 30 years of research. He had a theory that some people hearing voices uh, navigated it better depending on how they understood why they had the experience. That was his theory. And uh, he did this research and he found out that people who feel themselves to be stronger than their voices tended to do better. People who communicated more about and through their voices tended to do better. Those who uh, set limits and listen selectively to their voices tended to do better. Now, it's really hard to set a limit if you're not listening to the voice. And I'll tell you something about voices. <laughs> yeah, sometimes voices are like three-year-olds. Have you ever told a three-year-old, I'll get there, not now. It's Saturday morning, let me sleep. What does that three-year-old do? It gets louder. It gets more provocative. It demands your attention. And sometimes voices are the same way. And so if you actually, you know, and there's a difference between listening to them and doing what they say or believing them. You know, uh, anyway, so many frameworks really work really well with one exception. There's one framework that tends to keep people stuck. And I'm going to ask people if they could guess and put that in the chat and show you if you can check out the chat. What is the one way of understanding a voice hearing experience that might keep somebody stuck? Anybody have thoughts? I don't see anything yet. People are thinking. <laughs> um, hi, this is Mary Lisa. I was just going to say one thing would be just not um, acknowledging it. Right. So if I'm ignoring, denying, distracting, which, by the way, 15, 20 years ago, that's, that's what the mental health system had to offer me. They would say, just ignore it. 
And I felt like screaming at them and seeing how good they would be at ignoring it. You know, you're telling me to ignore it, a voice yelling at me. And that the framework that has taught the ignore strategy, don't look at it, don't talk about it, don't share it, is the mental health system, old school. Right? And the other reason that that framework would keep you stuck is that people were told, I was told, you have a serious mental illness, you'll be on medication your whole life. Um, you'll never be able to work. You should be happy for moments in time when you're not institutionalized. And that's, that's why I was told. And if I was told that, what, what would I try? Why would I try? I'm being told I'm hopeless, that my best bet was for a better medication to come out. I'm trying to move this along quicker though. So, okay, you guys got to answer this question. What color is the dress? Please put it in the chat. What color is the dress? Yay, signs of life. All right, so I think we have a little uh, problem with consensus reality. Because I am seeing a lot of different colors in there. I've never even heard of the yellow one before. Like, uh, so yeah, white and gold, purple and black. Um, so what happens? Let's. Uh, I'm a white and gold person. What are you, what are you, Sherry? I see a bluish purple with brown stripes. <laughs> All right. So if I say to you, Sherry, you're wrong. You're delusional. Do you want to talk to me? <laughs> no, I'd probably at least, I, I hope I wouldn't, but I think I'd probably want to argue with you. <laughs> right. And so that is what we're saying when we say acknowledge that the experience is real. You know, I have to believe Sherry when she says, this is what I see. If I don't start off with that premise, we're not going to get far in a conversation. I don't have to say that's what I see. Right? I can say I see something different, but please tell me about what you see. Does that make sense to people? Um, so that's the first part. Uh, usually family members are like, no, no, that's not happening. No, 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 it's not real. No, no, no. Right? And that kind of stops the communication. Somehow I, I feel as the voice here that I'm, I'm bad, I'm wrong, or they think I'm lying. So acknowledge the experience is real. Not to feel obligated to do what the voices tell you to do, you know, but to be curious. Why is it coming up? What's the metaphor? What's the meaning? Why is it coming up now? When does it come up? I was going to groups and uh, I said, I have a voice telling me to kill myself. I knew not to say that to my psychiatrist, who was a lovely man. I just told him, I think someone's trying to kill me, which wasn't much better. But the, the group, yeah, he said, well, well, let's adjust the meds. But uh, the group said, you know, when do you hear it? And I said, all the time, because it felt like all the time. And they said, get file cards. And whenever you hear it, write it down, just briefly, like time of day, where you are, what you're doing. And the first thing I found out was I don't hear it all the time. Oh my gosh. It just felt like all the time. And uh, that began to shift my relationship to that voice. Eventually what I did was I wrote down what it said. And then we could see where else had in my life had I gotten those messages. Did I believe those messages? And they're usually shame and guilt messages. Go ahead, Sherry. <laughs> I just thought, I thought it was such a great response that I think it's Talia or Talia put in the uh, chat, um, they wanted to know, so what is the actual answer to the, the name of the color? It sort of proves the point that we're, we're trying to like think that there's only one right answer. So I just thought that's right, the right, right. I've had lawyers, I, I've done this for commitment lawyers and they're like, who's right? And I said, do I need to tell you who's right and who needs to see the doctor? Like, what do you mean who's right? <laughs> And so it really depends on the pigment 
in your eyes, right? And other stuff that I, I'm not aware of. So what's really right is whatever you really see. And uh, would be my answer. But yeah, people do get into, well, who's right? Well, I'm telling the truth, are you? All right, so more context of voices. Voices can serve as a reminder of unresolved issues or on the anniversary of an event. This is something families have that, that doctors and therapists don't have that knowledge, right? Of like you as a family member can say, oh, I see every November you struggle. Let's think back, you know, was there anything that happened in, in November? You know, oh, your best friend from high school died in a car accident. Maybe that voice is related. Maybe not, but let's see. Um, voices starting in the year of a major of major life events, and um, and major life events are in the context of how sensitive the person is. And so, for somebody, it might be uh, a really big deal to have moved during freshman year of high school. For somebody else, it might not have been a big deal. So, to be really open about what was a major life for that person, the way they saw it. Uh, we talk about the lost loved one. I'll just throw out a curious thing that um, when somebody hears from somebody who's passed on that voice, it is not a good message. Again, it's usually shame and guilt. And uh, of somebody saying, you know, I, I feel bad I wasn't there for them or I feel responsible that maybe I could have stopped it. Sometimes people get a voice like that. Uh, when I've done training with veterans, which I love to do, I learned that veterans sometimes see and hear from people they've killed. And I was like, wow. Um, sometimes there's a voice that's a spiritual guide. I had a mom write and say, my young child is hearing voices. Talk to me. And, uh, and I called her up. And I said, what's happening? And she's like, well, I have an eight-year-old and she's hearing a voice. And I said, uh, have you asked her if she knows the voice? Yes, it's her grandmother. And I'm like, is her grandmother alive? No, she died last summer. And I'm like, what's the problem, you know? But this mom didn't know. Like I said, it's a voice giving her a hard time. She said, no. It's a comfort. But the whole idea of hearing a voice kind of freaked out the mom because she didn't know it was like, actually a normal human experience for all kinds of people to hear from a lost loved one. Uh, I had a friend of mine who would go to the group who would hear from his dad. And, um, you know, a year in, he's like, I don't hear from my dad anymore. I miss him. I'm kind of sad. And I said, well, you know, why don't you offer it up, you know, maybe like a prayer or attention and just ask him to come back. He comes back the next week. He goes, my dad came back. And you know what he told me? He told me, I don't need him right now that I got this. But if things ever get hard again, he'll come back. Um, <laughs> the biggest one that, that I see is that causes distress is a voice that repeats negative messages. So if somebody was bullied in school, there may be a voice that's repeating what that bully said. For me, you know, I experienced childhood abuse and, and my meanest voices, you know, once I wrote down what they were saying, I could recognize they were saying the things that were said to me when I was being abused. Sometimes the message is more of like a cultural or global one. You're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not successful enough. You know, it could be more of a, societal message than an actual message you got from a person. Um, I love this last one. Ages of voices can be linked to events that happened when the person was at eight. So like I had a six-year-old voice, like never aged as I aged. And I had 12-year-old voice that never aged as I aged. And so a really important question is, gee, Cindy, what was happening when you were six? You know, maybe that voice is holding on to an experience. 
or a part of you. Like when I do look at the word psychosis, the way the Greeks defined it, they talk about splitting into parts. And, um, and in that way, I can relate to that word. When, when life is too hard to hold the way it is or the way I think it is, you know, maybe I break into pieces to try to survive, to have a piece of me survive. Um, and so I think this is a really, I really love uh, this um, list. Uh, this woman, uh, Jamie, she had her own experience, which she could define. Um, but these things, these problematic beliefs, I see these not just in voice here. Sometimes I see it in family members. I should have known better. I did something wrong. I can't trust my own judgment. Look what's going on with my loved one. These are really uh, tough messages. Sometimes these messages are what voices are saying to somebody or because these voices are saying this to somebody, these are the person's belief. And so if there's experiences, if there's counter messages we can give, uh, like that last one, you know, I can't get what I want, I'm powerless. You know, providing choice and options in somebody's life, that's like a counter message to this. So I had a lot of these beliefs, but as I had different experiences, it changed my beliefs. That's something family members can do. You know, I'm in danger. Well, Cindy, I'm going to stay with you and nobody's getting to you unless they come through me. You know, uh, or Cindy, what would help you feel safer? Can we lock the doors? I had a period in my life where I put pots and pans on my stairs because I didn't, I felt in danger. And the point was I could hear somebody coming up the stairs before they could get in the apartment. Now the people around me are like, what are you doing? I said, I'm not hurting you. There are my stairs, my pots and pans that helps me sleep. Let me do that. Uh, and, and kind of going back to what Sherry said, uh, you know, my mother and father both struggled, but uh, my mother really hit a tough spot when a psychiatrist gave her Valium and told her not to drink. That just, like, did not work out well. Nobody was talking to us kids. How do you feel? So if you're living with somebody going through something big, you guess what? You might be catching a little trauma. I feel powerless in this. I feel impending doom. Um, you know, I feel like this is unreal. Like it's hard to believe even what I'm seeing, right? Questioning reality. So this slide is for family members and for their loved one. Let's address shame and guilt and get it out the door. Like I, I feel like saying, throw shame and guilt out and put love in there that's the antidote you know 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 that you do the best you can with what you know when you know better you do better um being seen heard and validated it's really hard to be seen heard and validated if you're talking about voices and visions and people are telling you you're wrong or don't talk about it or that's just a symptom uh, playing a role in one's own healing or rescue that helps people move out of it because now you're not powerless. Um, human connection and sharing information. Sometimes people couldn't give me power, but they could give me information. They can say, okay, you're in the ER. We're going to look for a bed. If we don't find a hospital bed, you know, we can send you over to respite. That was empowering to know what the heck was going on. You know, sometimes that's just like, So uh, one of the biggest things I've learned is I need to take care of me or I'm not around to take care of somebody else. Wrecking me is never the solution, right? And that's really hard for family members sometimes. Like I used to tell my son, I wish I could donate a kidney and that would help. 
You know, if there was a thing I could do, I would do it. But sometimes I would do too much, and then I'd be a grouch. You know, and it just wasn't right. So I, I need to know what my limits are, and I need to be able to state them, owning them. So I, instead of saying, you're driving me crazy, I can say, which I did say, uh, I can say, I need sleep or I turn into a grouch. Can you listen to that music on headphones? And you know what he said to me? Can you put in earplugs? I said, yeah, why don't we both do that? You do the headphones, I'll do the earplugs, and maybe I'll get sleep. Uh, starting with our basic needs, uh, food, water, sleep, and shelter. If I don't have enough sleep, or they don't have enough sleep, you know, it's just got to be hard. Um, help isn't help if it isn't helpful. You know, and whether that's a, a particular counselor, treatment program, whatever, or with my son, sometimes I did things out of parental guilt, but they weren't really helpful. And so I had to sit back and say, is this really helping? And, and have a conversation with my son. We've done this four times. We have gone through this thing four times. I don't think it's helping. We need to do something different. So now, you know, I really try to think about, is this really helpful? And of course, he says to me, well, let me know when you figure out how you can be helpful. I said, I will let you know. And you, if you have ideas, feel free to tell me. But I know I can't do this thing anymore. And uh, be transparent about your own needs, concerns, and fears. Um, yeah. And sometimes that is, you know, I'm so sorry I can't do that. Or I'm so sorry I can't fix this. Or I really wish I could. Or I'm wor I'm real I'm worried about this. You know. <sighs> Holding multiple truths. So this is a little bit about like um I think it kind of covers this. But like even in the same family, each member might tell the story differently. You know, so to say, okay. I had a great intent, and it landed poorly for them. Both things can be true, right? Can we quit fighting about that and just say, hey, I'm curious. How did you come up with that idea? Uh, one of my kids, when they were uh, 12, they were assaulted. And, you know, I took them to the ER, did all that. And then I went to the police station, and I went to the school. And I told the police, I want you to pick up the kid who did this and scare him. I don't want you to arrest him, but I want you to scare him. Years later, my daughter said, you did nothing. Because she didn't, I didn't tell her what I was doing. You know, she got her stitches, she got home, and I went out the door to take care of business, but never even told her. So it's kind of that kind of thing, you know, if, uh, you know, if I had kept her in the loop, she would have had an idea. Um, building connections instead of arguing facts. You know, uh, I think that blah, 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 blah is going to happen. And instead of saying, no, that will never happen, you can say, how does that make you feel? Have you heard of something like that happening before? Or... Again, if somebody, you know, says, you know, I have this voice yelling at me, you may never have had a voice yell at you, but I bet you you've been yelled at. And you might say, hey, I hate getting yelled at. You know, that's connecting, building on strengths, curiosity, those open-ended questions. And I... want to get us... I want to do this, but we really don't have time. This is like, I wanted the group to have practice making metaphors, but uh, maybe we'll try to do this. So I go on a unit and the person says, the doctor on this unit is an agent. Now I can say, oh, they're crazy or that's a symptom, or I can try to understand what are they trying to tell me? So if people have guesses on any of these, what that could be a metaphor for, so what is uh, the doctor on this unit is an agent. 
my parents are vampires, but not the evil kind. Uh, I like the, it's a B, but, all right. The doctor on the unit is an agent. The person said, yeah, he's like a travel agent. He gets to decide when and where I go. And I was like, hey, that kind of makes sense, right? Like, I'm trying to seek to understand Oh, yeah, spying on me and reporting. That makes sense, too, right? I was thinking of that, like Secret Service agent, FBI agent, right? Yeah, it can mean different things, but the point is to try to figure out what it means, right, to that person. Uh, the vampires, you know, mom was, like, really upset. Oh, my son has this unusual belief. And I said, what do you think it means? Oh, I like this red wine at night. That I love that. What it meant was his parents were getting older and they were talking about end of life and what would happen, who would take care of him when they were gone. And so his solution was to say, they're vampires, they'll, know, they'll never die. Oh, I love this. They're going to investigate my blood and report it back to the police. Yeah, and so... And I would say, wow, have you had issues with the police? Oh, I love this is war. What this person said, parents versus staff deciding who gets what they want. Um, in this particular thing, um, a mom said, I'm really concerned because he ended our phone call with this is war. And so I was throwing out things like, is he watching the TV? You know, like I'm trying to figure out things that it might mean. And um, and what he said to me was, uh, what I, I said, you know, maybe he means it's a war within himself. And the mom said, that's it. But if I hadn't asked those questions, we couldn't have gotten to what she went from being very afraid that he was going to, you know, do something with war versus he was saying he had a war within himself. Uh. I was talking to a guy who was pretty, hadn't talked for a long time and was starting to trust me and he had a lot of anger, but he was starting to trust me and sharing his voices. And I asked him, you know, do you want to tell me what this voice is saying? Like I could see him talk back to the voice, but I wasn't hearing what the voice was saying. And he said to me, it's a B. And I'm like, you know, I'm pausing. Okay, okay, it's a bee. And then I said to him, okay, when I think of bees, I think about honey and I think about getting stung. And he said, yes, it has five, it has five ways to sting me. See, you know, that was a way of getting information. Uh, I have a voice telling me to kill myself. If you ever watch the HVM Beyond Possible film, you will see Caroline talk about the metaphor there. Maybe something in my life needs to die, but not my heart. Maybe there's a relationship that needs to end, that I need to stop living my life this way right now. Something needs to change. All right, so in the moment, this is important. In the moment, it looks scary. I'll give you an example. I come into my house and my very large teenage son is in the kitchen with a machete swinging it. I'm freaking out. And um, I call somebody up and they say, is he threatening? No. Is he yelling? No. Is he breaking anything? No. And they say, well, why don't you ask him what he's doing? And I said, hey, what are you doing? And he said, Shh, be very careful. Be very quiet. You could hear it cut the air. I was very quiet, which was good. It helped me calm down. I'm like, I can't hear it cut the air. I could. And I said, now, can you do that outside? Because I'm freaking out. 
<laughs> Can you do that in the backyard? Okay, that looks like a dangerous situation, right? Fortunately, you know, as someone to talk to, to help me calm down, the family member calm down. Now, what if I hadn't had that person to talk to? You know, I have to think, if this is truly dangerous, what will help increase or decrease the danger? If I had called the police and said, my large son, who you all know, is in the kitchen with a machete, that would have been way more dangerous. Right? Uh, another option, if it, if I hadn't been able to figure this out, out, a less dangerous thing would be for me to leave. So when I'm looking at a situation, I need to figure out how do I make this, A, is it really dangerous or not? And how do I, you know, increase or decrease? Um, somebody will call me up and say, they're pacing, they're pacing. I'll say, great, that's helping them stay in their body. You know, or he's yelling again. Where is he? He's in my room. He's in his room with the door shut. I'm like, okay. I said, uh, you know, if you want, you could knock on the door and join him in yelling at his voices if that's what he's doing. You can listen, you know, and see what the themes are. Uh, I'm a big fan of FU therapy, of like, how do you get that anger out? in a way that doesn't uh, impact other people. So driving around in a car when the window's up swearing, you know, the anger, if, it, if somebody has anger, it has to get out. How do we do that in a way where it doesn't impact people? Turning F you into F this. It's all your fault. You wrecked my life. You're not helping enough. Right? Somebody's yelling at you to say, I'm angry too. I'm angry. I haven't been able to fix your life. The safest place in that anger is to partner with somebody. I'm mad this is happening too. I'm frustrated too. To be seen, heard, and validated. Um, the more calm I am, the calm can be contagious. Somebody's loud, I might get softer. Somebody's loud, I might get smaller and stay calm. Um, uh, one more, two more on this. Uh, consider the impact of the relationship. However I respond, I also need to think, how will this impact our relationship? Will they trust me? You know, can I be forthright and honest? and say what's going on or what my fear is or what I need. You know, it's, it's just heartening to me when someone calls me up saying, I called crisis on my son and I'm like, did you talk to him? No. Did you give him a heads up? Did, did you give him a choice? But that happened last night and I said, can you go back to him and give him a choice? You know, what do you need? for you to feel all right about this. And it worked out. But yeah, that has to be before, unless there's like, you know, whenever possible, I'm gonna try to have a conversation about it. This is the model we use, validation, curiosity, vulnerability, community. I see you as a person, I accept you, I'm here to partner with you. I value your individual story, your whole story, I care about you and your life, and the context of this moment. Vulnerability, I'm also a person with my own strengths and limits, and including, like, what am I able to do? Community, we're not alone. You know, maybe we need families. We need more people on the team. We need more support, right? How do we get a bigger community? Uh, I have a few more slides. Uh, I'll just, the one on this, I'll just say future plans. Plans of their making, not the family's plan. You know, it can be small. Something to look forward to, something to build on. 
opportunities to name feelings and express them. I know, you know, when I got a diagnosis, if I had a feeling, it was like everybody thought it was a symptom. I couldn't even be mad when my son had a car accident with my car. I'm like, dude, you don't have a job. Who's going to fix my car? Everybody's like, don't get upset. Don't get upset. No, it's, this is normal. It is normal to be mad about this. This is not a, a, a something else. Common strategy. So I had a group where uh, somebody told somebody else how to breathe, how to do relaxing breathing. And the other person said, don't tell me how to effing breathe. I know how to breathe. So another strategy is for me to say, hey, I need to take a deep breath. You know, like modeling that. Or you want to go for a walk or um, those kinds of things. You talked about choice and power. Uh, families can mirror back strength. You know, to keep that, you know, that person, like, you know, whether you can see the person who's in there from before whatever happened, happened, they're still in there, you know, calling out to that person. You know, I believe in you. I've seen you do amazing things. You know, whatever is sincere. Remember the time when. You know, or uh, there's one person I uh, love to play baseball, but now wasn't able to. And uh, the mom took him to go watch his cousin play ball or his nephew or something. And that was great. You know, it reminded him of what he enjoyed. He might not be on the field, but he's still enjoying watching the game. This is like the real punchline. I'm almost done. This is what family can offer that usually nobody else can or not in the same way. Connection. I can remember visiting my son in the hospital at a time when he was very mad at me. And he said, why are you the one who always comes? I said, because I'm the one who loves you no matter what. I'm sorry that you're unhappy that it's me, but I'm the one who shows up for you. You know, and also in my own life, I used to think, you know, I need to be connected to somebody or I'm going to fall off the planet. So somebody to be connected, someone who cares, someone who, you know, wants to know I'm okay. Uh, timeline. If I'm having these uh, big events and or if I'm taking psych drugs or the combination, sometimes I may have a very hard time keeping track of the timeline. When was I here? When did we leave, live there? You know, when did these changes happen? Like I, for me, I have like things I can't remember that I can't forget that I wish I could that are burned into my mind, but I can't tell you what year they happened. You know, so so trying to keep track of that. I think um, some of these drugs marketed as antipsychotics really impacted my memory. You know, that I just couldn't, I wasn't holding the memories. Like, it just didn't get, get into long-term memory. Uh, so, yeah, family can provide uh, that timeline, awareness of the here and now. I know it feels like whatever the person says it feels like. But right now, you're with us. You know, right now, you know, you know, we, you know, to let them know they're not alone. Um, for me, I would, uh, you know, get thrown into this fear with a voice that was like replicating a, an awful experience. And somebody would say, you have power now. You can take care of yourself now. And they would like build me up. That happened and that was awful, but this is different now. I'll, I'll give you an example of, uh, I'm driving a car with somebody who did two tours of duty in Afghanistan and it's really hot. My air conditioner is not working in my car. And I see him start looking up, and looking on the side of the road. I said, are you looking for helicopters? Yes, and roadside bombs. And I said, look a little harder. 
See all the green grass? You are not in the desert. But his body, the heat reminded his body of this time of tremendous fear. It wasn't like even in his conscious mind. So that's something that families can offer. Positive messages, calm context, modeling emotions, holding that vision of a, uh, I was talking to uh, a family member who said, we told our son, no man left behind. We're in this with them. You know, we're, we're gonna get through this. So hold that vision of possibility. This is my last slide about advocacy. Promoting informed consent. You know, here are these psych drugs. This is how they work. This is the impact of taking them. They can be really helpful. And these other things can happen too. Like what, what's the information? Like I was so mad when I found out that Haldol I'd been taking for over 10 years was thinning my cortical lining. I wish somebody had explained that to me. You know, so it's tough. Um, but informed consent is also what are other options that you can add to or instead of. Have you tried neurofeedback? Have you tried EMDR? You know, are there other things we can do? Uh, sometimes people get put on certain drugs because we've tried everything. And I'm like, no, you haven't. You haven't tried everything. You know, have you tried, you know, yoga? Have you tried whatever, you know? Let's try a lot of things and, and see what works for that person. Let's get a lot of tools in that box. Pills can, can help me sleep, can calm me down, can calm my mind, but they really don't help me process feelings or trauma. They really don't help me change my beliefs. They, they sedate my beliefs, my problematic beliefs. Um, amplifying the voice of the person receiving services, being a witness. Um, this is not just about the mental health system, but I think in general, people behave better when there's witnesses. And so if you're a witness, you know, if somebody's in a hospital and you call that hospital and say, that's my son in there, my daughter in there, I think your son or daughter is going to get better treatment. Even if the hospital says, oh, they didn't sign a release. And the parent can say, yes, I know they didn't sign a release, but I want you to know. They have family. I think that's really important. Um, sometimes I would go to meetings with people and I would take notes. I can remember a psychiatrist saying to me, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking notes. What are you doing? Because they were taking notes too, right? What are you going to do with those notes? I said, I'm going to give them to the person so they will have notes on what happened in this meeting. Like, oh my gosh. Why not? Um, making sure the whole person is seen and not just reduced to a diagnosis. You know, that's really important. Um, gathering information. You know, what have they been on? What has worked? What are, what are good times in their life look like? Um, documenting services. You know, at some point, somebody may say, hey, I want to put that puzzle of the past 10 years together. It's great if you have the pieces to help them do that. Uh, and sometimes this includes advocating for different options or services. You know, and that might mean, I can remember uh, in Massachusetts, I said something about, you know, she said, you know, sometimes the community of choice or the thing that somebody wants to do, you know, it might be the comic book club or it might be rugby or it might be, you know, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. It might be, you know, and, and the people at departmental health said, well, we don't have any mental health groups like that. I'm like, yeah, they don't have to go to a mental health group. Like they could just go bowling. It doesn't have to be bowling for people with diagnosis. Like, can they just 
can somebody just pursue something in the world uh, beyond that? So I have done a ton of talking, and I'm wondering if people have questions or comments or. Yes, and feel feel free to either unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat or raise your hand. And by the way, I have to say, Cindy, I love the note-taking response. <laughs> uh, taking notes, what are you doing? <laughs> Makes Go sense. Ahead. Dari, can I just jump in for a minute? This is Janice. Uh, of course. Hi, Janice. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Cindy. I'm Janice Sondor. I'm actually the one of the co-directors of the New England MHTTC. And I have to jump off a little early, but I just I wanted to make sure that I jumped in here really just to kind of thank you, not just for today's presentation, but for kind of the work that you're doing in this space. Um, like Sheree was saying when, in the introduction about our recovery and resilience principles at the New England MHTTC, you know, we're always trying to promote recovery oriented strategies and resources, and that's always better when it's informed by lived experience um, perspectives. And we do our best in that, Front, but we also know we need to do a lot more. So I told Sheree, I was just so excited that we were kicking off 2024 with this conversation in particular. So a big heartfelt thank you. Um, on a personal level, in addition to being the co-director of the New England MHTTC, I'm also a loving mom of a young adult who's pretty open about their distress from mental health challenges. And I learned a lot today, a lot of really good reminders about what's maybe helpful and frankly not so helpful as a family member sometimes. So um, big thank you. And you know, hopefully we can do more of this in the future. Yay. And I and um I was, you know, it did my heart good to see that slide about your values. I'm like, oh, oh it's so nice to come into that kind of environment for a change for me. Yeah. Like, yeah, cool. Thank you We're so trying, much. but we always need to do better. But this is a part hey, of it. So thank it's you. So a, it's a process, right? I keep learning. So I see a hand up. Go ahead. Hello. You hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. My name is Mercida. Um, I kind of put in a track. During Thanksgiving, I had my cousin that called me in distress. Um, she goes to, well, was going to Emory, which, you know, is a really, really good school in Georgia. Um, right around that time, she called me, hey, come get me. I came and got her. And out of the blue, she was kind of like just dazed. And then she sat with me. And then out of nowhere, she kept saying, I need to go to a church. I need to go to the church. Now, we're really spiritual people, but um, I just finished my documentation as a mental health coach. So I knew something was going on there. And um, right out of the blue, just to be quick, she said, I know what you're thinking. And mind you, this never happened before. I never seen this out of her. She said, I know you're thinking God is finished with me, but I still want God. And that kind of scared me first. But then I was like, you're safe. I love you. I prayed with her. Then she calmed down. And then, you know, she finally slept. She stayed with me the next day. She was like, I'm going to campus, get my stuff. Um, long story short, she goes back to campus. She kept wanting to come here. And her mother was like, stay there, pack up. She kept wanting to come back here. I think this was a place of safety that night. They called the police. Um, she was saying vulgar things she had never said before that was sexual. And she started cutting out all her hair. They took her to a mental hospital and they diagnosed her with psychosis. So with that, I was just kind of wondering, like, as a family member that's supporting her and also deal with PTSD and um, anxiety, how can I, like, help her and so not, I, like, fall? So I would, uh, just like with anybody having a big experience like that, I would say, let's look at what was happening in the preceding year. And, um, and when you're saying God is done with me, the thought I had was shame and guilt. 
that something happened that she's feeling an incredible amount of shame and guilt about. That would be my guess. Yes, when she was 16, I found out that she was addicted to pornography. Right. And, um, and yeah. And so what, um, so whatever framework somebody has, so if they have a spiritual framework, I would use tools in that framework. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I felt like uh, there is a God, but I don't count, like I, I believe in God, but God doesn't believe in me. You know, I worked with somebody who, um, you know, could use scripture and prayer, you know, to change, uh, to change that. You know, he would say, you know, Moses killed somebody and look what God did with him. You know, he just tried to convince me that I was loved and that, uh, you know, God knows everything I've done and already for has forgiven me. But I'm just saying that, like, whatever the framework somebody's in, if it's a uh, spiritual, you know, I would jump into it. If it's, you know, the electromagnetic waves are frying my brain, I would jump into that one. How do we get you to a place where there's no Wi-Fi for you to rest up? I've done that with people. So I hope people aren't taking offense with where that conversation went, but I try to get into whatever framework somebody is giving me. So yeah, I would address shame and guilt. Give her a place to tell her secrets. Let her know she's loved. You know, I don't know what your spiritual beliefs are, but use those. If, if that involves a loving higher power, you know, I would go down that road. Well, thank you. And that's what we've been doing and she is getting better. Um, but that was a secret I didn't know about. I'm just grateful that I was here in Atlanta and she knew to call me. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm imagining something that happened at college. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a general statistic. One in four women are sexually assaulted on a college campus. And that's what we fear, and we need her to tell us that, but we want to do it on her own timing. Right, but, you know, this is what you can do. You can talk about shame and guilt in general. Okay. You can give information. Sometimes when something bad happens to somebody, they blame themselves. Okay. And we and want you to we know fear. we love you any, always. It's not your fault. You know, or you can share, you know, you may have a personal experience of, something happening and somebody blaming you. you know. But yeah, you can give general information about moving through trauma and shame and guilt. You don't yes, have to so I was able to, details. Yeah, I was able to do that with her because I, you know, I was molested as a child, but I was able to explain to her how that impacted my life, but and also how I was resilient and um then I and I was staying with her through all of it. But that's what we fear have happened because she didn't want to go back to the campus. She didn't want to leave my house. And when she left my house, that's when it all happened. Yeah. But thank you so Something much. Something on that campus. All right. Thank you so much, Cindy. You've You're been welcome. great. I, uh, I put a, um, a really long, unfortunately, link in the chat box that has a PDF of the slides. And Sherry did say that it is uh, recorded. Are there other questions? I'll say we, you know, the Wildflower Alliance offers two family and friends groups a week. You can email me if you're interested. The Connecticut HBN also has a family and friends group. Andrea, I see your hand. I just wanted to jump in and say thank you. I am a member of the HBN family and friends and what we heard today from Cindy has changed my life and my relationship with my daughter who hears voices after her father died. And um, it was a rough go until I came and learned about this perspective. So I thank you, Cindy, with all my heart and I'll continue to come. And I'm so happy people are, are learning this way. Thank you, Andrea. I asked some of the people from the family and friends group, somebody show up and give me moral support. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. We, we have one more uh, hand up now, Suzette. Hi, Cindy. Thank you so much. This is incredible. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm going to be meeting with the family uh, with young siblings um, 
who, you know, experience their own confusion and trauma and fear, you know, witnessing um, the client, you know, having an episode. And I'm wondering if you have any insight or advice um, on how to approach like young teenagers or, or, or you know, children, uh, siblings about that. Okay, so how do, you know, so what goes through my mind is how do we try to normalize this? How do we... Uh, how do we help these kids identify what makes them feel safe? So when this is happening, where do you feel safe? What do you need to see happening for you to feel safe? Right? Like each person's needs. And somebody may need to say, you know, I need to know if X happens, more help's coming. Or I need to say, you know, I need I need to be able to stay in my room and keep the door locked. That makes me feel safe. Uh, one family, um, one of the kids uh, was older, and they just felt safer if they could lock their bedroom door. You know that that helped them feel safer. Um, but you know, you the everybody, you know the everybody in the family probably has a stigma, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hearing voices, killing people, guns, right? So let's let, let's blow that up a little. You know, let's get give them information that there are people who make it through this, that there is something going on. That there, there's a team working on this. Yeah. There's a team working on this. Uh, are there things that they can still enjoy with their sibling? Uh -huh. So it's not a total rejection of the sibling. Right. Can we still play video games together or, you know, whatever it is, you know, because that's what happens, you know, someone gets totally marginalized because people don't understand and they're freaking out and they don't feel safe. Yeah. You know, so those are the things. How do I feel safe in this moment? You know, can I learn that, you know, people go through this and sometimes they become actually even psychiatrists. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was thinking of Dan Fisher, but yeah, you know, how do I would worry about let's not have them be traumatized too. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, just looking to see if there's any last minute questions. We might have time for one brief one, but yeah. I want everybody to thank Sherry for inviting me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's my pleasure to have you here. Just, it's an honor, and I learn so much every time myself. So grateful you were here, and grateful that all of you were attending today. Right. And we will, we will have the uh, video up soon, um, as soon as possible on the MHTTC website. Uh, let me share. Do, um, did you have any final words? I don't want to cut you off, Cindy. No, no, just, you know, if people want to email, I will respond sometimes quicker, sometimes slower, but feel free to email. Thank you. And we do have a survey at the very end of this that will pop up. Um, please uh, fill it out. Just take a couple minutes, a moment even to fill it out. That would be very helpful. Let's see. Okay, and as you see here, you can either scan that QR code um, or click on the link below it, or it will automatically also pop up. We can also send it out by email. We try to get your feedback because we value it. Uh, and just a huge thank you from the New England MHTTC. It was great to have Janice um, pop on as well, Janice Tanzora. Um, you see our website here. That's where the... Um, you can find everything about MHTTC, including past recordings of all our events and the email, New England at MHTTCnetwork.org. Again, thank you, Cindy Hedge, for your wonderful presentation. And thank you to Christine, um, who is in the background helping with tech today. Much appreciated. Um, can you go back to the survey slide? Of course. Good idea. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, thank you for being here. Thanks, everyone. Take care and have a great day. I'll leave it up for just a minute so people can catch it, and then I'm...
and I'll stop. Okay, folks are fading off. Have a have a great day, everybody.